Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Shallu la ilaha illallah 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 Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah And do not follow the footsteps of the devil, of a shaitan, because he is to you an open enemy. This verse is beautiful and very comprehensive, as are all of the verses of the Quran. This verse, once again from Surah Al Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, the 208th verse. The Sabah bin Nuzul, or the reason why this ayat was revealed, is concerning one of the great Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam was Jewish. And he wasn't uh, just any ordinary or regular Jewish person. He was, in fact, a Jewish scholar, a rabbi. And he took shahada. See, there, there are some people who, regardless of where they are in life, when they hear the truth, they accept it. When they hear or come across the truth, they accept it, regardless of who and where they are in life. This is Abdullah ibn Salam. The opposite of this you could see in another Jew that lived during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know that one of his wives was named Safiya. She used to be a Jew, she became Muslim. He married her. 
But before this, when the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, her father, Huayn, when he heard about the my, uh, pilgr uh, the hidden of the Prophet ﷺ coming to Medina, and he had a conversation with his brother. And the one narrating this, this story to us is Sophia herself. And so between her father and her uncle, there's this conversation going on about the Prophet ﷺ. They went to check and to verify to see if this man, Muhammad ﷺ, who claims to be a prophet, is he the same one that our scriptures speak about? The whole reason why we're here in Medina, the Jews were in Medina for a purpose. They were waiting for the final prophet. They were having a discussion, is he that one? And they affirmed that yes, he's the one that our scriptures speak about. And so the uncle of Sophia said, well, what are you going to do now? What's your position? And he basically said, I'm going to fight him and oppose him every step of the way, even if I have to die in the process. So you can see two people from the same orientation, but the truth reached them, and they react to it differently. As we said, this verse, O you who believe, enter Islam completely, and do not follow the footsteps of the devil, because he is to you an open enemy. This verse was revealed specifically <coughs> concerning Abdullah ibn Salam wa ashabihi and his companions. Now it was revealed about their situation, but obviously it's been included in the Quran so that we can adhere to it and we can practice the lessons which come forth from it. The reason why this verse was revealed is because Abdullah ibn Salam and those who took Shahada with them, who were coming from the Jewish faith, they still held on to some of the practices that they did, that they had before Islam. Those practices that they didn't, in, in, according to their logic, didn't contradict Islam. They still adhered to the Sabbath. They still observed the Sabbath. In our Arabic class, we learn in the days of the week, right? And so, Yom Sabbat, which we translate as Saturday, is their Sabbath. Sabbath literally means rest. Sabbat means to rest, or to relax. So, on Saturday, which begins on Friday evening at Maghrib, and ends on, su on Saturday evening at Maghrib, the Jews, they don't do anything. They don't work, you know, in this society, if they observe it, if they practice or adhere to the Sabbath, you, don't, you won't see them driving, using electricity or anything like that. And we spoke many times here about the situation with the Sabbath breakers that Allah mentioned in the Quran. Well, Allah tested them. It was a fishing community, and Allah tested them with making the fish you know, easy to catch on the Sabbath. So, observing the Sabbath, and for some reason they wouldn't eat camel's meat. And they saw that, that, that these two practices didn't necessarily contradict Al-Islam. Logically, in their mind. Remember, this was the suburb of Nuzul. This is why this verse was revealed. But it's Ibra, it's lessons in it for us. And it's teachings in it for us. So as I'm talking about this, I don't want your mind to stay 1,400 years ago and just stay there. I want you to use 1,400 years ago and connect it to what's going on now with you and us. So because these Muslims 
Allah began the verse, Ya ayyu haladhina amanu. Or you who believe. He's not talking to disbelievers. He's talking to believers. He's talking to Muslims. O oh, you who believe, udkulu fi silmi kafata. O you who believe, enter Islam completely. In other words, you using your logic to see what you can drag with you into the into Islam. But Shaitan is a smooth person. He's a smooth dude. He was here before us, and he knows how to get at you. This is why uh, he says, shaitan. Do not follow the footsteps of a shaitan, the devil. Allah could have easily said, shaitan. But Allah didn't say that. He said, shaitan. Do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Because see, shaitan don't lead, you, don't lead you astray all at once, all in one big whop. Life really don't work like that. A lot of us are trying to get rich all at once. Usually don't work like that. You have to have a discipline. You have to have a code. And you have to adhere to that code. And eventually, gradually, you will build upon your wealth and build upon it. And then, if Allah decrees, you will be rich. You will have a lot of wealth. But in this society, people will see the end result. They will see that you got rich. They will see that you got that bag, but they didn't see the discipline that led up to it. Likewise, some people will see your righteousness. They will see your Islam. They say, oh, this is a good Muslim brother. This is a good Muslim sister. They're strong. I never see them doing anything wrong. You see the end result, but you don't know the discipline that led to that. You didn't see the night prayers. You didn't see all the dhikrs. You didn't see all the salat. You didn't see all the times they bit their tongue when they wanted to curse someone out and somebody disrespected them and they, and they didn't just snap on them. You didn't see that. You just said, oh, this person just righteous. No, this person get mad just like everyone else. But he had the discipline. Likewise, shaitan has a discipline with his evil. He's not just going to come all at once. He's going to slow walk you. This is why Allah said, do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. This is why every step of the way, you have to make sure that your thinking, the way you see things, the way you act, is consistent with the will of Allah, is consistent with the Sharia, is consistent with Islam. Do not follow the footsteps of Shaitan, because he is to you an open enemy. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, 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 this is one of the beautiful things about not only having the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an example, but also we have 124,000 Sahaba as examples. See, all of their journey to Islam was different. Some of the, some of the Sahaba were second generation Muslims, like Abdullah ibn Umar. He was a young man when his father embraced Islam. Like Aisha. Abdullah ibn Abbas. They were young people. Some people embraced Islam as adults. Some people were born into it. Abdullah ibn Zubair. His mother, Asma. She gave birth to him making the hijrah. Right outside of Uba. She gave birth to Abdullah ibn Zubair. Very big, famous, important Sahabi. Male, female, young, old, out of, not out of, free, slave. We got a whole lot of examples. Rich, poor, handicapped, single, married. Got a lot of examples to draw from. 
This ayat brings forth, it shines a light on Abdullah ibn Salam. And it's important, Allah begins the verse, Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu, all you who believe. Sometimes us as believers, we can hold on to some things that according to our mind and our logic, it's right. It's good. It doesn't contradict Islam. It's not haram in our mind. But we don't know. We just took a footstep. We just took a step on the path that shaitan has laid out for us. Extremely important. You have to understand that shaitan, he's so sneaky. When you have a society that's not governed by Islam, shaitan is in control. Forget about who you see at the wheel. Who you see is the prime minister, or the president, or the king, or whatever title is the one running the place, or the, the count, or, or the parliament, or the congress, or the senate, or the house of representatives. Above all of them is the shaitan. He's the one that's in control. And he's more sneakier than them. A lot of you worry about secret societies. You worry about the Illuminati and the Trilateral Commission, and you worry about all of these hyper-secretive groups. The one you really have to worry about is the Shaitan. Because he embeds paganism and shirt in everything. Even the days of the week. Now, a lot of us are used to saying, all of them pay homage to a different pagan god. Even Friday. That's why I don't like saying Friday. I don't like saying Saturday. Because all of them are paying homage to different pagan gods. The different names of the months of the year. Exact same thing. All of them are invoking different pagan gods. And if you think there's no big deal, just look at the opposite. Look at the flip side. You Muslim, you do some form of dhikr. You know that at some point, the dhikr, the azkar, the something that you say repeatedly on your tongue, is only a matter of time before you begin to get conscious and cognizant of what you're saying, and you understand it, and it goes past the tongue to intellect, and it reaches the heart. This is the case with the dhikr of Allah. What about the dhikr of a shaitan? We keep repeating and repeating over and over and over again all of these things connecting us to not just one pagan god, but dozens of pagan gods. And you worry about the Illuminati and ain't thinking about shaitan. Well, that tabi uku to watch his shaitan, he'll slow walk you to the hellfire. And Anas qala qadima Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al Madina wa lahum yawmani yal abuna fi hima faqala ma hadha lil yawmani qalu kunna نل أبو فيهما في الجاهلية فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله قد أبدلكم فيهما قيرا منهما يوم الأدها ويوم الفطر أنس the servant of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم may Allah be pleased with him reported that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم came to Medina and the people had two days in which they were engaged in games. Pay attention to the hadith now. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it to Medina, there were two days that they singled out every year, and that they would just have festivities. They just play games. You know, a lot of us have brought into this false dichotomy of something being religious and non-religious, right? That's, that's something made up in your mind. For a believer, everything is religious. You get rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having intercourse with your wife. If anything is not religious in our minds, that would be intercourse, right? Because even the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, 
A person gets rewarded for fulfilling his desires? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, of course. Don't you see that if someone did it in a way that it was prohibited, like zina, he would get punished. Likewise, when they fulfill their desires in a way that is permissible, there's a reward in it. So we don't have this secularist mind, mind this way of thinking where, you know, that's religious, it's not it's religious, not religious. No. Someone from outside of Islam tricks you into thinking like that. It's one of the footsteps of shaitan. Everything you do falls into a category. Everything you do, every action you do has a hook. It's either wajib, obligatory, it's haram, it's prohibited, or it's um, uh, mandub, it's, it's uh, highly recommended, it's makru, or it's, you know, dislike, or it's mubah, or it's permissible. It has a ruling. There's a reward or punishment attached to it. You may not know it, but it is. So this think this Freemasonic way of thinking, religious, non-religious, that's not from Islam. And anytime you hear somebody a Muslim saying that, make sure you correct them. So they had two days in which they would just play games, they would just celebrate. It wasn't connected to uh, uh, a, a so-called religion, as we like to say. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what are these two days? In other words, what is the significance? They said, we used to engage ourselves in them in the, in the uh, pre-Islamic period, the Jaya leader. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah has substituted for them something better than them. The day of sacrifice and the day of uh, breaking the fast. In other words, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. And this hadith has been collected by Abu Dawood, and Sa'i, and al -Bayhaqi. And the commentators, they go on to mention that one of, the, one, one of those days was the day of Nehru's, which was the solar new year of the Magians, the fire worship. So it was their new year. They would just say, you know, like how we, a lot of us have, we don't think nothing's wrong, happy new year, right? They was doing that in Medina, having a good time. And then the other day was Mahmajan, uh, the spring equinox. So these two days, were connected with their calendar and their season. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam substituted them for that. Now, this month that we're in, Rabi Thani, the fourth month of the Islamic calendar, we're in the middle of that month. You was awake last night, you saw the full moon. The full moon lets you know you're in the middle of the month. Last month was Rabi al Awl, the month in which many of us believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. And by the way, there's, this different, there's difference of opinion on it. There's no scholarly consensus on that. But in any case, many Muslims have accepted that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born during that month. If you know anything about our Islamic calendar, in the calendar that a lot of us follow in our regular lives, which is called the Gregorian calendar, you know that the Islamic calendar is about 11 days shorter than this calendar. So what does that mean? Every year, a particular day will come earlier and earlier and earlier. That's why Ramadan comes and flows through the seasons. It, goes, it comes earlier and earlier and earlier every year. And don't sleep. Ramadan be here during May this year. Early and early and early. All right? If you remember two and three years ago, Rabi al Awl came around this time. What's this time? Late December. Christmas time. Show you how Shaitan works. A lot of Muslims, and I'm not knocking that, that's not our position, but I'm just letting you know, a lot of Muslims celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's been a scholarly difference of opinion that's been going on since it started, about a, about a thousand years ago, 1100 years ago, right? During the month of Rabi al Awl, where people single that month out and designate that to be the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and do different things to celebrate his birth. That's not the discussion today. 
but I'm just reminding you of something. And what's the purpose of me reminding you? To show you how shaitan works. So, many Muslims celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, so long way so. A couple of years ago, it came around Christmas time. And I've been Muslim long enough to realize that nothing should surprise me. I haven't seen everything done in the name of Islam. So, many Muslims were saying, since it's okay to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah says in the Quran that we shouldn't elevate one, one prophet over another. Look at the logic, you see it coming. We celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We shouldn't give preference to one prophet over another. It's Christmas time, so I'm celebrating Christmas because I'm celebrating the birthday of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. And many Muslims were celebrating Christmas under the guise of celebrating the birthday of Prophet Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, over under the pretense that since it's okay to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it's okay to celebrate the birth of any other prophet. And I'm just going to pick out Isa, Jesus, and celebrate his birthday on December 25th. Look how Shaitan works. Do the sneaky. First of all, any Christian scholar or Muslim scholar or historical scholar will tell you that Jesus was not born nowhere in December and specifically not the 25th. Everybody knows that. Or everybody should know that. And what you have to understand about the time that we live in we live during a time, like, you know how you go on the internet and you see a picture and you want to know, is it real or did someone Photoshop it? Brothers, can y'all move up? We need to send the ranks anyway. We're running out of space for this time. You want to see if that picture that you saw on the internet, it may have Hassan Ali's body on it, but it might have Umar's face on it. They superimpose the face of one person on the body of another person. It's Photoshop. If you can understand that concept, you can understand how most of these holidays and a lot of these days that we think are religious, what they've done. They Photoshop holidays. What do you mean? They'll take a pagan ritual and put a Christian face on it. A lot of you don't even know that in many places in Europe, like England, celebration of Christmas was prohibited until the 16th, 17th century, the 1600s. Because they understood that it was a pagan festival. And it's laced with all types of pagan rituals. The specification of December 25th for the so-called birth of Jesus had nothing to do with Jesus. It has to do with a, 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 a pagan dude named Mithra. Sol Invictus. He's a real, look him a real, real interesting character. He was born on December 25th. So a lot of you who are doing that, and what you're doing has nothing to do with Jesus. Even the whole thing with the, you know, with Santa Claus and the reindeer, all that is connected to different pagan rituals. Even the Christmas tree. You know, there are a lot of Muslims now, they want to Photoshop the Christmas tree. They want to have a Christmas tree in their house and light it up and put a star and a crescent on it. The people are really discussing this thing right, right now. Right? The Christmas tree is an evergreen tree because you've got to understand a lot of these pagan uh, rituals, they have their roots in, you know, the season and the weather and the climate. Because see, during the, during, in, a lot of, in a place where, in a, in a region where a lot of these uh, festivals originate, a lot of them are in the north, extreme north, and it's extremely cold. So the winter represents death to them. And the summer represents the coming forth of life. And so for them, when they saw that 
all, every, all types of vegetation, plants and trees die. And the only thing, only tree that's still standing and still green is the evergreen tree. They thought that there was something holy and special about that tree. And that, that tree had special magic powers. And so that's why there's a lot of different rituals connected with this tree. That's why they will take a piece of it, make mistletoe, and put it at the top of your house, and you know, you kiss under the mistletoe. They make wreaths out of it. It's what they call, it's like called ta'wiz or amulets. Like, you know, the good omens. So you see, a lot of us in our logic, in our jahiliya, we Muslims, but we bring in that paganism into our life. And we Photoshop Islam on top of it. Yes, I got the Christmas tree. Yes, I got the lights. But I don't have, it's not in Christianity. I mean, look, it's the start of Christ. It's Islam. But again, you're paying homage to a pagan god. And you bring in a shirkin paganism into your deen. And this really goes to what the Prophet said. And many of us have heard this well known hadith where he said, Men to Shafa have the omen for who are Whoever imitates a people, he is from among them. But the deeper thing about this, a lot of times we talk about imitating people and all that kind of stuff. But for you to want to imitate somebody is indicating something deeper. That you love them and you identify with them in your heart. Because if you don't love somebody, you don't identify with them, you're not going to imitate them. You can deny it all you want, but you're not going to try to copy somebody that you hate, that you despise. You copy them because you have some affinity. For them. You, you know, you want to be like them. That's why you imitate them. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, that there is no imitation in the outer unless and until there's imitation in the inner. In other words, the, the reason why you're copying them and imitating them in their festivals and their holidays and their dress and the way they talk and their slang, etc., 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 is because you already love them in your heart. And your limbs are only manifest, manifesting what's already in your heart. That's why it's like this. So a lot of Muslims celebrating Christmas. Yes, I, when I took you, I would never believe I'd be saying this. Muslims celebrate Christmas. Right before Juma, I was sitting in that chair, right there, right in the back. And I was and I looked at my email. And I'm I'm not going to name the organization, but I opened an email and it said, Merry Christmas. From such and such organization. Ah, that's a part of that. For me, that was a confirmation that I should talk about what I would talk about today. And so we have Muslim individuals and organizations wishing a happy holiday. That is nothing but paganism and shirk and everything that is an antithesis of what, they, what we say or what we claim we believe in. And we wonder in this time why Allah holds back his help, his nusra from a lot of us. See, this is why the Sahaba achieved what they achieved. And going back to the verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya you haladina amadu to kulu fisilmi kaapa. Well that's a tabi ukutu wa tishaitan. In the hulakum adu bin. O you who believe, come into Islam kaafa. All the way, completely, wholeheartedly, as Yusuf Ali translates it. Do not follow the footsteps of as shaitan. Don't follow the footsteps of the devil. Shaitan is slick. He's not going to come with a t-shirt on and a billboard and a flyer and a meme and say, Hey, listen, Muslims, I'm going to hell. Anybody want to go with me? He's not going to come like that. He's going to do it real slow. He's going to slow walk you. If you think you're a smart guy, he's going to come with you through your intellect. He's going to, logically, it doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we, we know our laws are one God, so there's nothing wrong with it. He's going to come with you like that. If you're an emotional guy, he's going to use emotional blackmail on you. He's going to say, oh, man, you don't never get a chance to see your family. He's going to come like that. Don't you miss your family? Don't you miss your cousins? Don't you miss them? 
However it is, you know, if you just want an excuse to eat, I'm like, well, it's the best day to eat, Christmas, Thanksgiving, but man, you gotta be alive. How, whatever rocks your boat, that's how St. Paul is gonna come at you. So we gotta be careful not to follow the footsteps of the devil. Make sure that, you know, that we, we hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever excuse you use, whatever logic you use, or maybe you try to rename it into something else, don't celebrate Christmas. Ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Got everything to do with paganism. Not just one type of paganism, several types of paganisms wrapped up in one holiday. And really it's the same thing with birthdays, it's the same thing with many other uh, of these things, even New Year's. Be careful, guard your faith. And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبَنَا تِينَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسْنَا وَفِلَا فِي الْحَسْنَا وَكِينَا لَا لِنَا عَبْنَا